Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Two Economists and a Lender, where we take a deep dive into the most important economic issues facing agriculture. I'm your host, Carly Jacobson. So once more, we have David Widmar and Brett Gloy here from Agricultural Economic Insights discussing how to effectively manage the use of debt in your operation. We're also glad to have uh, Garrett here. He's joining us from as our lender expert. Um, Garrett's a financial services officer who works with producers in Northwest Wyoming, um, and he's fortunate to continue to be part of his family's cow-calf and beef feedlot operation as well. This episode marks the start of our second year of bringing you topics related to managing financial risks in your operation. And given the uncertainties that we're facing, it can be easy to be consumed by factors that we can't control. So we hope these webinars help to bring you clarity and focus on the management strategies that you can control. So today's look at debt is no different. And so I'm excited. Brent, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Carly. It's uh, great to be here again this uh, month. And this week, talk about uh, debt use and how to kind of find that sweet spot of debt use. And as we start thinking about it, I think the thing that's really useful is to, is to remember, one, debt is a really useful tool. It lets us do a lot of things that we couldn't do otherwise. We can make investments in our operation to expand the size or maybe improve productivity, uh, all to kind of move the operation forward um, in a way that allows us to kind of bite off bigger chunks than we could maybe with just uh, retained earnings. But it's also important to remember that there's trade-offs. And, and the biggest trade-off between debt is it's, it's, we often refer to debt as leverage. And what leverage does is it increases uh, your rate of return when times are good, and it decreases it when it's bad. And I think this simple graph can kind of help illustrate that. So what I've got on here is a, is a simple graph. On the uh, vertical axis is the return on equity or rate of return on equity. And on the horizontal is the rate of return on assets. Now, when you think about this, if you have no debt, kind of think of that as that black line. It's at 45 degrees, which means that um, the rate of return on equity is the same as your rate of return on assets. When we add debt, think of it as the blue line. What that's going to do is it's going to give us a chance to improve our outcomes when, when times are better. And what that's going to do is if, if we're earning a rate of return on business greater than our interest rate, it's going to give us a big advantage. And that advantage gets magnified the higher the rate of return on assets that we earn. But on the downside, if we don't earn that interest rate in our business, we can we have to pay that interest to our to the debt holders, and as a result, you know it kind of pulls down your return on equity, and you can actually see it go negative in some situations. So that's the that's the leverage factor, and that's the trade off we're trying to balance: is how much of a good thing do we want uh, versus making it so much that we get ourselves into a situation where we've got too much risk. So debt is always, um, should be always be thought of uh, in the context of risk management, I think as well. So let's go forward and talk about how we get to determining what is the appropriate amount. And I think there are three big things we have to think about. One is what are the earnings of our business? Um, and my old professor, Ed Ledoux at Cornell, used to always say, well, there's, there's some businesses that can support a lot of debt and some that can't support hardly any. And they can be actually in the same industry and everything. It just really depends what kind of earnings that their business can generate and how stable those earnings are. The other thing to think about is what are your fixed obligations? So fixed obligations being things like debt service or family living expense, the more of those fixed obligations we have, that starts to make it harder to add additional debt. And it all goes along with cash flow. And then finally, we've got the balance sheet to think about. Um, a lot of times, what we're talking about is restructuring the balance sheet. So in other words, taking debt from short-term debt and moving it to longer term, what does that do? What's the benefit of that? It hel helps on the fixed obligation side, kind of reduces the short-term fixed obligations, stretches it out. But there's also an issue of just how much debt can the business uh, support? And we're gonna talk about all three of those things in the next few minutes. And putting this together, I, I reminded myself that early in my, my career as an ag economist, 
I became sort of hyper focused on one of these elements. It was the balance sheet and, and debt to asset ratio was one of those metrics that um, I spent a lot of time thinking about. And one of the takeaways that we really hope that you get from this is that there is no single metric or to, to really use when you're thinking about the appropriate amount of debt. We have to think about all three of these buckets. And we're going to walk through each of these buckets. And, and the reason why this is important. So on one side of the spectrum, you can focus on just one element, like me and the debt to asset ratio. On the other side of the spectrum, you can spend under each of these categories, there's several financial ratios and, and calculations you can do. And so you can become quickly overwhelmed with all the different analysis. And so we're setting up a, a high level framework. You can drill down to these after today's webinar, you can drill down as deep as you want to go. But what's really important to keep in mind is we always have to keep perspective in, in place. And so I'm reminded of this picture, right? When I was super focused on the debt to asset ratio earlier in my career, it was like looking at the white space of this image. And when I did that, like, oh, you see this candlestick holder, or this, this um, vase, okay? But what we have to do as great farm managers is is be able to have different perspectives and, and be able to focus on the different elements, whether it be the earnings or the fixed obligations or the balance sheets. We got to kind of zoom in and out of focus to make sure we get the full picture of what we're focusing on. So is it the two faces or is it the lamp? We need to see all of those as we think about this question about the appropriate amount of debt. So the first one we want to talk about is the income or the earning side of the equation. And, you know, as we think about all the different geographies represented by producers who are joining us today we have you know those in the corn belt with um blessed with good rains and deep soils and they have high yield uh, potential and that sets up for one level of earnings and as you move your way across the country we have different earning potential so if you're in a dry land scenario and you're raising wheat or you're out uh, maybe in the sand hills and have uh, cattle and, and you can't have the stocking rates as high as we see in the eastern parts of the country, you have a different earnings potential. And we have to be very aware of that, what that is for our region and what that is for our operation. And it's helpful to benchmark that over time um, and to see how that trends or how that might vary from year to year. Second question to consider is how can I improve this? How can I improve the the earnings, whether that's top line revenue or um, what's left over after I pay all my variable costs of production, the seed, fertilizer, how can I improve that? How can I work my uh, business to, to do a better job in that respect? And finally, when we think about the earnings is how much variability or risk is there? You know, one of the early uh, articles that Brent and I looked at with Ag Economic Insights is we all know agriculture is risky, but risky is a relative term. And so if you look at yield risk, right, the how much uh, variation there is in a five-year or 10-year run of yields on any, any county or even on any farm, it varies across the country. So what it means to be risky in Indiana is very different than what it means to have yield risk in Nebraska. Uh, and so we always have to keep that in mind. And so that's another element that we have to consider. And we're having an example here in a little bit, but always think about the what if analysis that you can do. What if my yields are five or 10 or 15% off of what my projections are? Yeah, and David, I think this earning side is one that oftentimes when people are talking about debt, you know, if you just take the hot button issues, what what have people been preaching to you for the last, I don't know, three years, build working capital? Is that a bad thing? No, you should build working capital, but it's one element of the question of uh, debt use, is debt asset ratio is another one. Well, it's not, the you know, I really think earnings – and earning stability are probably is probably one of the most important aspects of this question and probably the most underrated. Yeah, I completely agree. The next area here is this idea of what are we doing with the earnings that we're generating? How are we allocating those earnings that our operation is, is generating? A couple of ways of looking at this. The first way that we're going to share today is we gotta know our fixed obligations. And there's a handy equation here. It's, it's pretty easy. It looks like it's a lot, but it's easy to remember. It's the principal payments, plus your interest expense, plus your taxes, plus your cash rent. And that is one way of thinking about how you're allocating the earnings that your farm is generating. And so there's some benchmarks that the association uh, considers and that you know Brent and I think are really helpful and they're helpful starting points. So 
And of course, it's going to vary, right? It's going to vary across the geographies, but it's a starting point. So the one is keeping your fixed obligations maybe below $250 per acre or less than $300 per cow. Or uh, it's helpful to think of this as a percent of revenue. So less than a quarter of all the revenue you might be expecting. You should measure this yourself and you should have your own internal benchmarks. What's my goal and how is this trended over time? The second element to this that I think it's important to consider in this fixed obligations conversation or the other considerations what are your family living expenses, right? We also need to think about how family living fits into this, what's left over after we uh, pay our variable expenses and what we, how we spend those earnings. The second point are goals. And so as Brent mentioned, if your goal is to build working capital, you're gonna have to take some of those earnings and you're gonna have to earmark them to replenish your working capital. Or maybe you wanna create a down payment for uh, some farmland that you're looking to buy down the road. Okay, that's not, that's something that you're gonna to need to put in there and to think about. And so after we generate the earnings off our operation, there's only so much there. And we have to think about how we're allocating that. And it has to be a very strategic decision that we think about. The second way of thinking about this it's similar to the fixed obligations, but it's another measure, another way of looking at it, another way of slicing uh, that data is what we call the debt coverage ratio. I think the debt coverage ratio is one of the most important numbers you can calculate on your farm. And, and what it's pretty simple. It's just your how much money do you have available to repay debt? That's the debt repayment capacity. You divide that by your debt obligations. So repayment capacity is just take your income, Add your interest expense, add your depreciation, add your off-farm income, and subtract out your family living expense. That is the amount you have available to pay uh, your debts. And you divide by what your debt obligations are for the coming year, and you'll get a number. And hopefully that number is bigger than 1.5, maybe up to 2. But what we see is when that number gets closer to one, it starts to indicate more and more financial stress, more uh, challenges kind of meeting the short, the debt obligations due within the next year. And we'll show you that in an example, It'll be pretty obvious. So the third point that we've set up are the balance sheet considerations. Again, this is where I was focusing a lot on you know, that relationship between total debts and total assets. So the first one to think about is working capital. You know, working capital, in my opinion, is the original and the most effective risk management tool that farms have, or any business, actually. One way that we can measure that is current ratio, is current assets divided by current liabilities. A benchmark here is we want about 1.5 times as much assets as we do current liabilities. You can think of working capital on a dollars per acre basis or a percent of revenue. We have an entire webinar in the archive that you can go check out, and we talked about how to measure that and how to put a plan into place. It's a really great, uh, great lender on the, who joined us to give us some great strategies here. Another uh, set of metrics that you're probably familiar with are um, for one's the equity to asset. So a benchmark to that, take all your equity divided by your assets, uh, maybe about 60%. There's also debt to equity. There's debt to asset. These are again, measurements of the same thing. And this is how you can quickly get overwhelmed with all the financial metrics. And so we need to have a diversity of metrics, but we need to make sure that we don't become overwhelmed by them. And finally, I think one of the most important elements is what are your debt service obligations? Um, it can be hard to change those in 2020. It can be really hard to change our obligations for next year too, but so they're very fixed, right? But an advantage of something that's fixed is we can actually forecast them with a whole lot of precision for a long time in the future. And so we should be thinking about not just 2020, but the next two or three years and have a really right. good handle as to what our obligations are. All right, so I'm gonna set up this quick example here and then Brent's gonna talk us through and we're gonna talk about how we manage the risk as it becomes associated with leverage. So here is a budget. And so we, this is a super simplified example, but it has some powerful merits to think about. So the budget revenue here is a little over $600 an acre. We covered our seed and all of our uh, main operating expenses. And we said, okay, the earnings after we cover those bills is $306 per acre. And then we have debt obligations of about 220 and then we have family living. So our budget says we should be able to retain about $41 out of that. So if we look at that debt coverage ratio, we have the 306 from the earnings from operation, plus we add back the interest, subtract out that family living, divide it by those debt obligations, and that gives us about a 1.2. And we talked about earlier, 1.5 would be the low end of that ideal range. So we'd have a sort of a yellow light with this, with this number. But Brent, 
let's talk about what happens when we don't well, hit those expectations. Right. And so one of the one of the challenges we can look at this and go, well, actually, you know, it's forty one dollars. It seems like a pretty good uh, amount of cushion there. Uh, we've got twice our family living, but let's look at what just a ten percent shock to revenue will do to that. And so what we did is we took revenue down by ten percent. And what you see is that um, we quickly get ourselves into a situation where our uh, retained is negative and look at our debt coverage ratio. So it's 0.95, which means that our earnings from operations plus our interest expense are less than our debt obligations and our family living. Now you might notice you if you sit here and look at it, you go, well, actually I got 10 plus 244, it's $254 to pay $220. So I'm still good, right? Well, this is putting us in a situation where something's got to give, right? And what's going to have to give? It's going to have to be either the family living or we're not going to be able to meet some of those fixed obligations. And so that's why, you know, it's really useful to look at that debt coverage ratio and make sure it gets up there a little bit higher than that because it gives us just a heck of a lot more cushion. The other thing, if we're in a situation like this, what we have to do is we have to guard very carefully against those kind of shocks. And we've got lots of tools to do that. We have crop insurance. We have marketing tools. Uh, we can really impose a lot of budget discipline as going forward. So we really want to look at this. But the bottom line is when we have higher fixed obligations like this, and that debt obligation could also be a cash rent payment, it just gives us a little bit less flexibility, which means we have to really rely on our risk management tools. The other thing we can do, though, is to look at the balance sheet. And maybe this is a situation where we have a lot of short-term debt, so we'd want to kind of lengthen out the term on some of that debt and provide ourselves some cushion. So to kind of summarize and get us over to our lender, you know, what, what we say is, look, as we're thinking about total numbers and way to think about total debt, there's really not one ratio you need to look at. We think you need to look at several. And one of the things I encourage you to do is sit down with your lender and go through several of these, not just your working capital, not just your current position, not just solvency, but look at cap debt repayment structure, as well as your earnings generation, because earnings, remember, earnings is really, really key to determining how much debt an operation can support. And so it's a function of revenue risk, how much fixed cost structure you have, family living, how much those expenses are, uh, as well as your balance sheet structure. We can carry more debt if the terms are spread out longer. What's the downside of that? The downside, of course, is that it costs us more in the long run because we have to pay interest on that. So, you know, I think Think about, there's, there's a lot of different things to think about. We covered a lot here quickly, but hopefully we set the stage where we can talk to our lender now and have some good conversations about some of the practical natures of that use. Yeah, so uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Garrett back in January in, in his beautiful part of the world, and so I enjoy getting out there. And, you know, traveling, I was in there in January for a growing on me, and I thought it would be really cold and uh, flew into Montana and was in Wyoming. But it was actually in the 60s. And it was a beautiful, he, he rolled out the red carpet for the weather for us. And so I'm looking forward to visiting again with Garrett today. We have some questions for him. Garrett, thanks for joining us today. Really looking forward to this. The first question I have is Brent and I just shared some of our thoughts. What are some of the things that you think about as you're meeting with producers and talking with them about that balance between uh, too much or too little debt, finding that sweet spot. Well, thanks, David. And, and uh, I can tell you that that January was kind of a one-off. I don't think you can expect that kind of weather next time you come out. But uh, I mean, going back to this, the, this, this sweet spot, I think, and you guys have alluded to it in multiple spots, it's, it is such a balancing act and, it's, and it gets really more critical at the higher levels that debt and operation carries. Um, so you have to look at all those different metrics 
And additionally, I mean, it, it's variable between different operations. I mean, you guys brought up different areas, uh, the Sand Hills of Nebraska to Indiana. It's even more than that. I mean, in my little area, in my little corner of Wyoming, there's neighbors that have so much different uh, cost structure that they can they can maybe service the $250 an acre and their neighbor across the fence can't even service $50 an acre. So it's very, very variable. And I think it comes down to understanding your operation. And I guess another thing I, I would look at is how your operation takes some of that risk off the table. Crop insurance, forward contracts are very common in my area. You know, futures contracts, all those considerations. You know, as you mentioned, the diversity across the operations or across the geography, what about the diversity of enterprises within an operation, right? So it's common to maybe have row crops and we have some rules of thumb, you know, $250 an acre for, for row crops. And then there's livestock as well. And those work well in a presentation like we're giving today, but how do you help producers think about, okay, you have a mix of crops and they're all going to perform differently. And how do you aggregate that up to a whole farm performance? Well, obviously, the more enterprises you have, the more complicated it is, and it, it is tougher to use more simplistic measurements like that fixed cost per acre or fixed cost per cow. But they, those still serve as a good anchor point and a place to start the conversation. And I go back to my area. I've got, and a lot of our crops are forward contracted, so they're taking that piece of the risk out, but uh, they're rotating crops with very different cost structures. Say, uh, uh, one rotation will be malt barley and sugar beets. Malt barley, uh, I mean, the gross income is $600 an acre. Uh, when sugar beets are, are paying well, they can gross $1,800 an acre. So obviously what they can handle from a debt basis is very different. And their, their operation, I mean, you have to make that consideration. Um, additionally, when you start adding in different revenue streams, say custom farming and some off-farm income, Perhaps they have a feeding operation alongside those, all those things help spread out that fixed cost and allows an operation to kind of adjust those fixed costs per acre per cow up or down. It, you know, Garrett, that's a really good point. It, it gives them some extra income, but it also gives them some stability too, right? Right. It spreads out that risk and they're not so subject just to a uh, uh, negative movement in the sugar market. You know, they've got cattle feeding there along too. So, so can we, Brent and I set up an example about, you know, this idea of a one year event, a 10% shock and how that impacts your operation here in, in that year. But how do you distinguish and how do you think about a, a one-off bad year versus a structural concern within an operation where they're, how do you, how do you unravel that difference between, you know, a bad year versus I need to get in and, and restructure my business a little bit? First of all, good record. I mean, you really need to understand, was it a bad year or do you just think it's a bad year or do you think it's a good year? If you don't have very good records and you can't actually say to a certainty of sorts that it was good or bad, then, I mean, that's the first start. And then from there, why was it a bad year? You know, was it a one-off event? Was it a weather event? Was it a hailstorm? Was it uh, the market moved against you? Now, what could you have done a could you have planned around it? Was your crop insurance levels not high enough to absorb that hailstorm? Now, has it happened more than once? Has it been two or three years in a row that hail or these different events have happened and you're going backwards? That's when we would say it's starting to be a structural issue. There's one off, you have a hailstorm, but then the next year you make money with your cost structure. But uh, if you're multiple years in a row, then you're not managing your risk. You've got too much debt. And like you said at the beginning, right, the first thing is good records. So first off, we got to measure, we got to know where we're standing, and then we have to start that investigative process to really to, to dig in. So let's think a little bit more about that, those fixed obligations. And we talked, uh, let's, we're, we can include family living, right? We talked about the fixed obligations plus family living and their goals. What are some of the observations or what are some of your thoughts about how an operation can go about allocating that bucket of, of funds and, and how they might go about changing or reallocating that over time. Well, the easiest way for me to kind of explain it is to use myself as an example. I run cattle with my two brothers and uh, I use that fixed cost in our, in our scenario. Now, if I take our specific example, our fixed cost per mother cow is $466, which is significantly higher than our standard. However, ours works pretty well because 
each one of us are wage earners and we do not have to rely on any income from the cattle to, you know, live on. So we can run a higher, higher fixed cost than someone that has to pull their living expenses from it. Again, using myself as an example, if, if my family of three were pulling my living, we'd go from 466 to $800 per cow before we even pay for a stem of alfalfa to feed those things. So, I mean, it, obviously it's very sensitive to that and managing that going forward. So if we ever wanted to do anything else, we've got to, you know, get rid of the debt we have now to even think of having room to provide some living or to step off on that next thing in our goals. It's a really great example. I appreciate you sharing that. And like you said, as you think down the road, right, we have to know where we stand today. And, to, and that's really important for our direction going down the road the next five, 10 years. It's really important important to recognize. What would you recommend to a producer who is watching this and they might feel like they're a little bit out of whack with respect to their ability to meet all their obligations and they might want to learn more. What would you recommend be being a first few steps for them? Well, first they need to have that conversation with their lender. I mean, because of the variability in this, I mean, they could be out of whack based on a few of those ratios, but in the other instances, they might be able, might be one of those operations that can carry a little more debt. So I think it starts with that conversation. Yeah, I think it's important to have that conversation earlier because these things can snowball. And if we don't get them tightened up early on, they can turn into a much bigger problem down the road and harder to fix. I was going to say the other thing to think about is, you know, there's always opportunities. And uh, some even if you're not, in a, even if you feel like a great position, sometimes it's useful to sit down and kind of understand you know, what, what are the possibilities in case some of those extra opportunities come up as well, right? Correct. So Garrett, I have my last question. Uh, you didn't escape without having to answer this. If you could have, it's probably not a billboard in Wyoming, but a billboard in Nebraska or, or Kansas or South Dakota where, where thousands of farmers and ranchers could see one piece of advice that you give producers here in June 2020, what would that advice be here today? I think you got to look at debt as a, as a tool. It's a tool in your toolbox as a producer. Um, when you use it correctly, it allows you to accomplish things that there's, there would be no other way to handle them, you know, in, in a shorter amount of time for sure. But just like any other tool in that toolbox, if you use it wrong, you're going to have some problems. So you say, take the example of that big three quarter inch drive you have, you use it like it should, it'll break a lot, those rusty nuts loose. No problem at all. You throw a, a cheater on it, say a six foot cheater, it still might break those, those nuts loose, but you also might not like the outcome. So yeah. that's kind of the way I look at it. Right. <laughs> Every tool has its place, right? Correct. <laughs> right. Well, that's a great example. Garrett, thanks for joining us. I will always remember that leverage example that you just shared about how that works. We had one question that came up when, when we were going through the the example, David, where we went through the budget. And so I just kind of wanted to know where the heck are those numbers coming from? The question revolves around, well, how on earth are you guys calculating this debt coverage ratio? Why are you adding $10 here and subtracting 45? And what we're doing, and the reason we're doing that is we're, we're calculating a ratio of how much money you have available to pay for debt divided by how much debt obligations you have. And so if you look at the bottom of this, there's our earnings from operations. Now we've subtracted out interest expense already. So that's why we add it back. We add that $10 back of interest expense because we, we took it out from that earnings. Okay. And we subtract off the family living expenses of $45 because we've got to spend those on our family living. So that top number then becomes the gross amount that we have available to pay for, to cover our debt obligations. Our debt obligations then are 220 and that would include this $10 of interest. And so that's why we kind of do some of those algebraic gymnastics to get to that ratio. But the bottom line on it is if you just step back from it and think about it, it's how much cash do you have available to, to service debt, 
relative to how much debt do you have to service. It's, so it's really pretty simple. Uh, so we can make it complicated. Uh, professors are really good at that. But at the end of the day, it's just that really simple thing is, you know, how much cash flow have you got available to service debt relative to how much debt do you have? Okay, I've got another question on multi-year equipment leases and should they be treated as a fixed obligation? An equipment lease is clearly an obligation that you have to pay. So it should either be uh, treated as an expense and taken out of your cash flow. So how much you have available to pay for debt. If it's not taken out there, then you you have to uh, you have to count as a debt obligation. So, yes, I would include it as a fixed obligation. And I don't know how uh, the association handles that, but in the big picture of things, yeah, we we have to pay it. So we need to get captured somewhere. We do capture it as a fixed obligation or a debt. We represent it, as a debt, right. which has been a hot button thing. I don't think it was that big when I first started with farm credit. Uh, but in latter years, they've gotten more popular, and uh, now uh, producers use them a lot. I mean, and they are a good tool to reduce your, you know, obligation on that newer equipment. However, it is still an obligation, and no matter if you're farming, you know, a thousand acres or fifty acres, or you've you haven't planted one seed, you're still obligated to make that lease payment, and that's why we look at it as we treat it as a fixed obligation. Yeah, it has to be included somewhere if we're really trying to get a handle on what the, you know, kind of cash flow position of the business is, we have to account for it somewhere. The same kind of issue related to even land rent. If you're, if you're not subtracting that out of your earnings, I mean, you're kind of giving yourself a misleading picture of where you're at. So um, we have to, we have to include it somehow to reduce the amount available we have to pay or include it as a fixed obligation. But yes, leasing is getting a lot more popular uh, from what I can tell. And I think driven in part by, you know, high equipment prices and uh, tighter margins. I think the big picture thing to keep in mind here is, it's kind of like going to a doctor and getting a checkup, right? And if, if you want to hide things from the doctor, you can, right? And the longer you hide them, it's not going to be a good long-term strategy. And so, the goal with this is to challenge, to encourage you to challenge your own thinking on what your, your farm's performance is. And so you need to have these critical conversations with yourself and, and really think about, okay, is this a debt obligation or is this, you know, something that's more variable, but do it so you can expose, you know, the truth of what's there, get, get beneath the surface of the water and, and really look at it. And then, when you start to benchmark with others, if you get into a benchmarking association or you're looking at university publications, then you really got to dive into those assumptions, right? And make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. So you have to be really focused on what you're doing for your own internal benchmarking. And then you have to sort of make sure you're comparing apples to apples if you're doing external benchmarking. Um, and this is where it gets frustrating uh, and difficult, but this is where the real insights in, in, the, in the stuff come out. So as an example, Brent and I were looking at some debt. It's actually some of the debt service obligation stuff that the USDA puts out. There's a couple different numbers and they have different assumptions. And we got into some of this and it's like, wow, this is an assumption that um, we would not have made. And in, in light of some of the situations that are going on today, we feel like they might be, that assumption is, is pretty significant and, and as a result of the challenges we face today. And so you have to be honest with yourself and then be very critical when you compare to other other data sources as well. So this is a challenging question that you're going to face every step along the way. So in terms of questions, uh, another question, you know, given the environment this year and just how uncertain it is, what, what has that done to kind of the picture, you know, for cash flow repayment on a lot of farms? And, I, you know, it's kind of a broad question, but I would say as you look at kind of the overall sector, uh, we've had some really big shocks this year, haven't we? The economy has really done some crazy things. Um, commodity prices have fallen tremendously. So there is, I think, going to be a little more financial stress going forward, and it's going to be really important to get a handle on it and to uh, to just kind of understand where you're at and uh, wh where things might be headed. But 
comes back to part of that risk management issue, right? Yeah, not to plug for our next webinar, but something that we're thinking about in the next next webinar we're going to be putting on together. And I think the other thing to, to note here is we've seen some of the shocks, right? But we're still waiting on some of the details of how some of the direct payments are going to play out. We have ARC and PLC payments that will get made here from last year's production. And so all those are important factors to consider. And so we have to have those good records. That will do it for another episode of Two Economists and a Lender. Thank you to Brent, David, and Garrett for leading today's conversation. And thank you in the audience. Thank you for joining us. Um, We look forward to seeing you online again next month.